Well, amen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49 as we continue in our study on the life of Jacob. And here in chapter 49 is where Jacob, now called Israel, is going to bless as well as prophesy over his sons. He's going to share a word regarding what their future will hold. And this is a prophetic word that God has placed upon the heart of this father. At the close of this is when Jacob will die. So this is the final thing he does to speak these words over his sons. That's what it says in Genesis chapter 49 beginning in verse 1. Then Jacob summoned his sons and said, Assemble yourselves that I may tell you what shall befall you in the days to come. Gather together and hear, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Uncontrolled as water, you shall not have preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are implements of violence. Let my soul not enter into their counsel. Let not my glory be united with their assembly. Because in their anger they slew men, and in their self-will they lamed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who dares rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes." And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. He ties his foal to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine, and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are red, are dull from wine, are like wine, and his teeth white from, are like milk. We'll just take those today. And look at the prophecy that Jacob gives over these first four sons. He brings those sons and he brings them in the order of their birth. Reuben being first. And then you have Simeon and Levi. And then you have Judah. All of those, if you remember, are sons of his wife Leah. And those are in the order. And he will carry on the prophecies according to their order of birth. The first of those sons that he calls up is named Reuben. And Reuben was the oldest of the sons, and because he was oldest and following the practice of that day, what should have fallen upon him would be the right to be the patriarch. He would be the father or the one who would be responsible for the clan. Because he would be the patriarch, he would have the opportunity of being the ruler over the family. He would be the decision maker over the family. He would also be the priest over that family that represented them before God. Those were the calls and responsibilities and privileges that he would have. And another thing, because he was the oldest and he received the birthright and the blessing, he actually would see, receive a double portion above everybody else. Each of the boys would get their portion, but he would receive a double portion because he was the oldest, he was the one who was privileged. But something happened in his life some choice he made, some direction he took that is going to affect him as to whether or not he is able to receive those privileges and those opportunities. Now, one thing that we need to understand through looking at this passage of Scripture is that choices we make in life, choices that we make, decisions that we make in life can directly affect the direction 
and blessings of our future. Now, let me say that again so you don't lose that. Choices that we make in life, things that we choose in life, can and will directly affect our future and our direction. Now, I think in our day and time, we've tried to forget that. In our day and time, we try to think, well, everybody just, they're not affected by choices they make, and nobody's responsible for the choices they make, and, and if you do make it, you'll have another opportunity to get by, and that really won't affect you. Well, I'm here to tell you, that's not the biblical truth. The biblical truth is that choices you make in life will affect your life. They will affect your life, not only then, but in the future, what will happen. And these prophecies foretell that. For Reuben should have been the one who received the patriarchal position, the opportunity to rule, the opportunity to be the priest, the opportunity to receive the double portion. But look what he says there whenever he talks to Reuben in verse 3. You are my firstborn. You are my might and the beginning of my strength. You are preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. In other words, to be first. You're the first one with the dignity of the family. You're the first one to have the power in the family. You are the one who has been given the privilege and opportunity of being preeminent in the family. That should have been his calling. That should have been his walk. That should have been the experience of his life. But hold on. Look at verse 4. Uncontrolled as water, you shall not have preeminence. He said there's a problem with you. You are uncontrolled like water or like boiling water. Water is uncontrollable, and when that water is boiling, it is uncontrollable. And he says, Reuben, your problem is, is that you have that uncontrollable spirit. You don't have discipline in your life. Like the boiling pot, you are boiling over, and because of that passions in your life and the lust of your heart, it caused you to do some things that you shouldn't do, and that's going to affect you in your life. Now, in order to understand that, turn back in your Bibles to Genesis 35. Genesis chapter 35, I don't remember, know if you remember this, but we're reading through the life of Jacob. This is one verse that just kind of sticks out there. It says, And it came about, while Israel was dwelling in that land, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. That was what happened to Reuben. He was uncontrollable like water, like a boiling pot. He obviously had lust within his heart, passion within his life, and it caused him to move into an incestuous relationship. Bilhah, who was one of the concubines or one of the other wives of his father Jacob, Reuben, being the oldest son, went and had relations with Bilhah and brought uh, shame upon his father and defiled his father's bed or his couch, he says. And he says, you did not live a disciplined life. You let your lust take over, and you didn't have control within your life. And because of that, he says, back in chapter 49, verse 4, because you were the uncontrolled as water, you shall not have preeminence. Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it, and he went up to my couch. It says, you shall not have preeminence. So Reuben, who was the oldest and should be given the opportunity of having all those privileges and opportunity with the oldest, he forfeited that opportunity because of that incestuous relationship defiling his father's bed, and he lost the position of preeminence. He doesn't have it. Matter of fact, you're going to find in this passage that he's not going to be the ruler over his brothers, but Judah instead is going to be the ruler over his brothers. Instead of being the priest over his brothers, he's not going to have the opportunity to be the priest but rather Levi and the tribe of Levi will eventually be those who will be the priest over the nation of Israel. And instead of receiving that double portion that he's supposed to receive because he's the oldest, it was Joseph who receives the double portion, and he's the oldest of the sons of Rachel. So everything that Reuben should have received, everything he should have had, 
because he was privileged, because he was preeminent, because he was given that opportunity, he forfeited that because of the decision he made in the lust of his heart, bringing shame upon his family, shame upon his father in that relationship with Bilhah. And what does Jacob say? You were given that privilege, you were given that opportunity, you were given that position, but you did not enjoy it. You did not take care of it. You did not respect it. But rather, in the lust of your heart, it causes you to forfeit that which was to be yours, that which you were born with, that which was your privilege. Then he moves on to his second and third sons in verse number 5. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Well, we know that they're blood brothers, but he means something different from that. They're not just brothers. They are alike. They are alike. Have you ever seen two people that walk up and you'd say, man, I'm here to tell you, y'all must be brothers. You don't just look alike, you act alike. Well, that's what he meant. They weren't just blood brothers, but they were alike. Their attitudes were alike. Their hearts were alike. Their thoughts were alike. They were brothers. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Listen, their swords are implements of violence. Let my soul not enter into their council. Let not my glory be united with their assembly, because in their anger they slew men, and in their self-will they lamed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. And what does it say? I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now, what's that talking about? Turn back in the book of Genesis, if you'll remember, to chapter 34. Remember what happened in chapter 34? One of Jacob's daughter, Leah's daughters, Dinah, they moved to Shechem. When they moved there, Shechem, who was the son of the king, had a desire to be with Dinah. And so Dinah goes over with some of her friends of that people of that country. And when Shechem has the opportunity, he actually rapes her. Now he rapes her, but he has this desire to be with her. So he brought shame on the family of Jacob by raping her. But then Shechem had his father to go and to ask if he could have Dinah's hand in marriage. And Jacob said, I can't answer that until her brothers come home, until my sons come home, and then we'll give you answer. And whenever they came home, they asked that question, well, will you let Shechem marry Dinah? And Simeon and Levi were the two brothers, her blood brothers. And they said to them, I tell you what, the only way that you can marry uh, our sister is that you have to be considered clean. And the only way you can be considered clean is you have to go through the act of circumcision. And if you'll go through the act of circumcision, then it'll be approved that you could marry our daughter. Well, they weren't planning on her ever marrying Shechem. They were angry at them, and they wanted to take revenge on them. But Shechem and his da dad convinced all the other people of that city, all the other men of that city, that they would do that, that they would all go and that they would have be circumcised in order for them to be considered clean so that Shechem could marry Dinah. Whenever they went through that act of circumcision, on the third day, it says, when they were in excruciating pain, then Simeon and Levi take their swords and they go throughout the city and they destroy all of those men. And they kill the animals. And they take over all of the spoils. And they have brought shame upon Jacob, it says. Why? Not that they brought uh, punishment on Shechem and even his father, but they destroyed the whole city because of their anger at what Shechem had done to their sister. Now go back to chapter 49. Is what it says. They're brothers. They're just alike. And their swords were implements of violence. Implements of violence. Because in their anger they slew men. Not just a man, not just the man who did it. They slew many men because of seeking revenge. And in their self-will, it says, they lame the oxen. What they wanted to do, what they decided to do, not what their father said, not what the plan was that the father would have, but what they decided to do is they went and lamed the oxen and destroyed the men. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. 
He says, matter of fact, in verse number 6, he says, My soul will not enter into their council. Let not my glory be united with their assembly. He says, they are such an angry, fierce, revengeful people. You don't ever want to go to them and ask for counsel, and you don't want them to be a part of your counsel. And you also don't want them to be the place where you're assembling to try to find their wisdom because they are driven by anger. I want to tell you something. If anger is a part of your spirit, you need to be in control of that anger. Amen? Anger will cause you to do things, say things, act ways that you shouldn't act and cause you to accomplish things that you don't want to accomplish and have results that you don't need or do not want in your life. And he says to them, Simeon and Levi, in their anger and in their revenge and taking and killing people, it is something that brought shame to Jacob. And he says, because of that, here is the prophecy. Here's the judgment that happens. Verse 7, I will disperse them in Jacob, and I will scatter them in Israel. That's what God said, that he's going to disperse them and scatter them. Well, that comes true. Simeon, actually, whenever they start to go in and they take that first census when Moses is there, their numbers have decreased so much. I think the number of them was only 22,000 compared to Judah, about 76,000. By the time they enter into the land, and it's time to enter in the land, and there's going to be the division of the land under Moses before Joshua leads them in, they don't even exist. Simeon is no more. They don't have enough people in their tribe to be given a territory, but rather they're just given a few cities. They were dispersed, and they were scattered and no more. As far as Levi, the tribe of Levi was not given a land. Do you remember that? They were the tribe that was not given the land. They eventually become the priest over, the, over that nation, and they eventually become those who are dispersed in different cities. He doesn't address the priesthood, but you know what he does say? They will be scattered, they will be dispersed, and neither Levi nor Simeon, either one of those, ever get any land in the promised land other than cities, not any section of land, because he said, I will scatter them, I will disperse them because of their sin, their anger, and because of bringing revenge and killing men who were not guilty, harming animals that they had no right to do because they were angry at what had happened. Be careful in your anger, even if you consider it, quote, righteous indignation be careful in your anger for Simeon and Levi and their anger brought about that punishment for their people well look at the fourth of those and probably the best known of those sons throughout history Judah verse 8 Judah your brothers shall praise you your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies your father's sons shall bow down to you Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion he dares, who dares rouse him up. Now, that's what it says about Judah. Your brothers will praise you. You remember what? Leah is the one who named Judah, and his name is praise. To praise the Lord. He is the tribe of praise. They were the tribe that led forth in leading and praising their God. Now, here's an interesting thing about them. Because they were the praisers, it says, and your brothers will praise you. Not only that, and that you will hold your enemies by the neck. They weren't just praisers. They were the most powerful warriors in all of the nation. They were the ones that everybody dreaded to see come. When they sent Judah, the tribe of Judah, business was taken care of. If they ever had a hard job, it was the tribe of Judah that went. You know why? Because those who praise always walk in power. You need to write that down, okay? One of the things in the Bible, those who are praisers, they always experience the power of God. Those who are praisers, they get to enjoy the power of God. Now, I want you to write a little footnote because I want you to put it in your own heart and mind. If you want to walk in the power of God, experience the power of God, sense the power of God in your life, then you need to be a 
Hey, some of you are awake. Thank you. If you want to experience the power of God and see the power of God and walk in the power of God and your enemy be held at bay, then you need to be a praiser. For just as Judah was a praiser, he was a powerful foe. Matter of fact, he was such a mighty foe. He says, he holds the enemy by the neck. He says, he is like the lion's whelp. He's like a young lion who has all the vigor and strength, who has the power to take down the enemy. He is like the older lion. He's also like the lioness who dares rouse her up. The lioness is, is, is probably more fierce than the lion. Did you know that? Did you guys hear that? The lioness is known to be more fierce than the lion. And she is especially fierce whenever they try to take one of her cubs. She would fight to the death. And the picture of him is like a young whelp and like the lion, even like the lioness. If someone were to t- take one or come against the family, then they were fierce. The tribe of Judah would be a mighty foe. They would be that foe that would be powerful because they praise, and their brothers would praise them. That's not all, though. What happens in verse 10? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. What are they going to be? They're going to be the rulers. Judah is going to be the ruler. Through the lineage of Judah, they're going to be those who be the kings and the rulers of the nation. Now, it wouldn't have ordinarily been Judah. Judah was fourth in line. Judah wouldn't have been that patriarch. He wouldn't have been that ruler. But what happened? Reuben forfeited his privilege. Simeon and Levi forfeited their opportunity. And it falls on Judah. Did you ever wonder why Judah was chosen? Do you ever wonder why it's through the tribe of Judah that David is going to be, or it's going to be through the tribe of Judah that the Messiah comes? Do you ever wonder? Because of the actions of Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, it falls to Judah that Judah would be the ruler. It says the scepter will never leave his hand. The scepter is that thing that the king would hold in his hand which pronounces the fact that he's ruler over that nation. And he says, you as the tribe of Judah, you will always be, you are going to be the ruler over all of your brothers. Not only that, he says this, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. When a ruler would rule, they had a staff. And whenever they would sit down on their throne, they would take the staff and it would run between their legs. And the bottom of it would hit the floor, and the other of it would be draped over their shoulder. So the staff, the rulership staff, was always between their feet. It was the fact that it between the floor and up, and they leaned upon that. And that's what they used as the rulership staff. And it says what? The scepter will not leave your hand, nor the rulership staff from between your feet. You will always be the ruler. Isn't it interesting about the tribe of Judah that whenever Judah... Is whenever the nation is divided, it's divided uh, and becomes a divided kingdom. It's the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah, right? The nation of Israel and the nation of Judah. The nation of Israel falls many years before the nation of Judah will ever fall. And the lineage, the kingship and the lineage comes through the tribe of Judah all the way to the Messiah. Let me show you this now. Look at verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, until Shiloh comes. Now, what does that mean? Some translations say, until he comes to Shiloh. Different translations, different theologians will say different things. Somebody said, well, that's the place of Shiloh. But the problem with that is Shiloh has never been formed at this particular time, so it really wasn't a place to be identified. Till he comes to Shiloh, the word Shiloh means rest or the one who gives rest. It's the idea that he'll be a ruler until rest comes. Well, when does that happen? It never happens during the tribe of Judah. It even doesn't happen even in David and Solomon's time because there's always upheavals and things. So there's really never reality that the rest would actually come. 
Some people think that Shiloh is a, is a picture of David who is going to be that great king, and he is a great king. But that's not what it means. What it means is this. It's a messianic prophecy. It's foretelling what's going to happen. It says, Judah is going to be ruling, and the scepter is not going to leave his hand until Shiloh comes, the one who gives rest. And who is that? It's talking about the Messiah. Judah will be the ruler. The scepter will not leave his hands. That, that staff of rulership will not leave his feet until the Messiah comes. And when the Messiah comes, then he will be one, it says, to him the obedience of all the nations. The, the Messiah is not coming just for Israel. The Messiah is coming for all nations, for all people. It said that to Abraham in the very beginning whenever God gave him prophecy that all the world, all the nations will be blessed through your seed. Same thing being said here, that when Shiloh comes, all the nations will be blessed. All the nations are going to eventually submit to the one who is Shiloh, to the Messiah. And isn't that true? Isn't there going to be a time when every nation is going to submit to the lordship of Jesus? Yes, it is. Has it happened yet? No, not yet. But what happens when he comes again? It says when he comes again that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And at that point in time, those who are in heaven, those in earth, and those under the earth, everyone in all nations will bow down and submit to him. That is the fulfillment of what it says here to Judah, and to him, Shiloh, when he comes, all nations will obey him, the obedience of all the people. He goes on and talks about the abundance of Judah. He ties his foal to the vine and his donkey's coat to the choice vine. Now what that simply means that it's going to be such a blessed place where Judah rules, where Judah reigns, that the vines that grow the grapes are going to be so big that you can actually tie a horse there. You could tie a young donkey there, and it would hold it. Now think about it. We're not talking a little bitty vine. We're not talking about something that a horse would pull off or a colt would walk off with. But the vines are so strong. The vines are so big. The fruit is so plentiful that you could actually tie your donkey there, tie your horse there. That's how big the vines are. He goes on and says, ties his foal to the to the vine, his donkey's coat to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. The idea is it's so plentiful. It is so plentiful that, man, don't use water, just use the grapes. Just use the fruit of the vine. We just wash our clothes in it. We have so much, so many grapes. It says this, his eyes are going to be red, as red as wine. There's so much wine. And his teeth will be white like milk. It's the idea that the abundance, milk is, the, is what's needed in life. And, and the idea of wine was the abundance of life. And it's the fact that where Judah is, it's going to be a blessed place. There are going to be ones who are praised. There are going to be ones who are rulers and the staff is in their hand. There are going to be the ones who will be in that position until Shiloh the Messiah comes, that all people obey. And they're going to be a blessed land. The land of Judah will be a blessed land of plenty. Well, you know, when you think about Judah and you think about the fact of the Messiah comes through Judah, Jesus is of the tribe of Judah. He is the lion, the tribe of Judah. You can understand a little bit about Judah. But he's the fourth. He, he was the first. He was the fourth. But if you see a little bit about his life, you'll understand how God already was picturing that Jesus would come, the Messiah, the Redeemer, would come through him. Let me tell you a little bit about his story. You remember whenever they, the brothers got Joseph and they were going to take Joseph and do something with him? The first thing that happened is they said, let's kill him. Let's kill him. But do you know who the brother is that stands up and says, let's not kill him, let's rather sell him to slavery? It was Judah. Judah said, let's not lay harm in him. Let's not do harm to him. Rather, let's let him live and let's sell him. Well, that might not sound real good that he sold him, but it's a whole lot better than killing him. Amen? 
And it's still a part of the process that God used Judah to change the hearts of the brothers whereby the nation was preserved. Even in the next chapter after that, you find, I think it's about chapter 38, you find the story of Judah and Tamar. You remember that story? Judah had sons and Tamar was married to the oldest and that son died and Tamar was given to the, young, to the next one and, the ne- and all the sons died. And they had the youngest son and, and Judah realized, man, this woman is not doing my children any good. And so he said, you, you just have to wait till my youngest son gets old enough to marry and lever at marriage. But he wasn't planning on letting her marry, and, and Tamar knew that. And Tamar eventually, because uh, he withholds that son, she eventually deceives him, plays like that she is a woman of the night, deceives Judah, and has relationship with him, and becomes pregnant by her father, our father-in-law. And all of that happens, and all that story happens, but here's the redeeming factor. Whenever the story ends... And whenever he finds out that what had happened, he accused Tamar of being unfaithful and she deserved to be punished. But whenever she sent to him the sign that revealed that he was the one who had made her pregnant and had been unfaithful, he makes this statement, and she is more righteous than I. She is more righteous than I. A spirit of humility in his heart, in his life. Another thing that Judah had was, you remember whenever... Jacob and Israel, or Israel was not going to send back the second time to get food. The reason it was is because the only way that Joseph said they could come back, they had to bring their younger brother Benjamin. You remember that? And bringing that younger brother Benjamin, Jacob said, I'm not, I'm not sending him. If something happens to them, I'll go down to Sheol. I'm not going to send him. And, and he wasn't going to send him until finally they ran out of food. And whenever he says, y'all go, he said, they say, we can't go without Benjamin. It's Judah who stands up and Judah says this, Dad, send Benjamin with me and I will be surety for him that if something happens to him, you can hold me responsible for that. I will watch over him. I will guard him. Dad, let me be the one that will take on that responsibility. And his dad, because of what Judah says, he willingly lets him go. Remember what happens when they get over to Egypt? When they get over there, finally... It's Joseph. He hasn't revealed himself yet. He takes Benjamin. And he accuses Benjamin of doing something wrong. He says, I'm going to take Benjamin. I'm going to take your youngest brother and I'm going to keep him. And whenever that happens, Judah stands up and he says, can I, can I have a word with you talking to Joseph, the prime minister, not knowing who he is? And he says, I, I want you to know this. He says, I, I promised my dad, whenever we told him that we had told you about the youngest and and you said not come back unless the youngest brother comes with you. And, and, and he wouldn't let us come back. That's why we're so long coming back. But your servant said to his father, Father, let me be surety for Benjamin. If something happens to him, hold me responsible. And this is in chapter 44 of verse 32. And this is what Judah says to Joseph. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then let me bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, lest I see the evil that would overtake my father. Hear what he said? He said, let me take his place. I want to take Benjamin's place. Keep me as a slave. Let me be the one held captive. Let him go free. For how could I ever go to my father lest my brother be with me? Well, that's a pretty great statement. Matter of fact, it's a statement that's going to be made many, many years later when Shiloh comes. For isn't it Jesus? Isn't it Jesus who's surety for us? Isn't it Jesus who stands in our stead? Isn't it Jesus who stands before God, not before Joseph or the prime minister of Egypt? And isn't it Jesus who says, take me instead? What I've done, what I've paid for, Let that be the payment for them. For hear what he said? 
For how could I go to my father without my brother? Whether you know it or not, that's what Jesus said about you. That you were worth dying for. That you were worth dying for. That he would go in your place. That you might be able to go with him. Jesus said that for you and me. Judah said that for Benjamin. And it's a picture of Judah's life that Judah, even though he was only fourth, not first, that God was preparing in his heart, in his way, a spirit, a spirit that would prevail through great men like David, but would eventually end up in the greatest of men who come from the tribe of Judah, Jesus. When Shiloh comes, Judah, the tribe of praise, Judah, the ruler, Judah, the one through whom the Messiah would come. I want you to know something. Decisions you make, choices you make, can directly affect where you end up in life, what you experience in life, whether good or are bad. Choices are important. Direction is important. Choose wisely in what you do. And remember this, Shiloh came, and he is the one who gives rest and gives peace, and he's come for you and me. And he stood there and he stands there today to make intercession for us because he paid the price that you and I might have a relationship with a holy God. If you don't have that relationship, you can have that today.